Okay. All right, so we're just going to start with a sound check. So we have microphones, but I just wanted to ask you whether you're comfortable with us talking without microphones. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. We'd much rather not. <laughs> Hold on to the microphones. <laughs> the microphones. Yeah. So I am going to start just by reading some things because otherwise I'll forget it. <coughs> For those of you who know me, um, in my book, I talk about the left brain and the right brain. So the left brain is the logical brain, for those of you who don't know, and the right brain is the creative brain. So when I'm about to do something like this, my brain just shifts into the right, ready to be creative. And so there's no logic, which is why I need Jacinta to turn the video on. Otherwise, I would never do it. Um, so I'm just going to read a few things to you because I don't want to forget the people that I want to thank. So I want to thank the sponsors. So as you can see, we've got some beautiful gifts here and you've all put your name down for a door prize. So later I'm going to spin a wheel and pull out the numbers and you can win some prizes. So I just wanted to thank the sponsors. So we've got Tracy from Soul Fit Yoga. We've got uh, Narissa and Pauline Schuster from Salty Air. Uh, Jacinta Carr from Jacinta Carr Design. The Bay Room, Rusty Cove, Glen Forest Animal Park, Lincoln Estate Winery, Gifts for Giving, Being Creative with Bev, and David and Rianne Lowe. So thank you to all of you for um, donating the prizes, which is really exciting. Um, and you would also all know that all of the proceeds from today will go to Mentally Healthy EP. So I'm very excited to have Lane here. So for those of you who don't know Lane, Lane is a pretty lady over there. In the <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, you may have seen the Zoom that I did with Lane. I was really excited to meet her and talk to her about her story and how she became involved and really came up with the concept and founded Mentally Fit EP. Um, and I think it's just such a wonderful organisation. So I was excited to find out about it and excited for the proceeds. So based on numbers today, we're going to have about $800 that we're going to be able to donate, which is really exciting. <laughs> so I wanted to just start by sharing my story um, and why I wrote the book. So um, it's an interesting thing because when I reflect back on my life, I was very, very blessed. I had such a blessed life. Um, who in the room knows my mum? Yeah. <laughs> so you know, you know what a blessed life I had, and my dad. Um, I, I was brought up in a very loving family, the eldest of five children. Um, my parents adopted two girls from Korea. They were just very giving people. Um, and they gave us wonderful opportunities and loved us very deeply. And I was born with this programming where I was... I just loved praise. I just loved people to tell me I was good, doing a good job, to say well done, you know, to give me a compliment. And my parents did that, and I think that's a wonderful way to parent, and I do that as well as a parent. Um, but it was interesting the way that I interpreted it because I became so addicted to it that it was like my drug, it was like what I needed. I needed someone to always be telling me that I was doing a good job. And if I fell short of that in any way, I felt like I wasn't good enough. And that wasn't anybody else, that was me. That was just my interpretation of it. And so by the time I was, well, actually, the whole eating disorder probably started when I was 15. Um, Naomi Wayne, does anybody know Naomi Wayne from Fort Lincoln? No, I'm just trying to know. So she was my best friend at the time, and um, I love her to bits, and this comment wasn't her fault. But we were sitting um, on the Asheville at Port Lincoln High School, and it was when there was old prefab buildings, no air conditioning, it was really hot, and we pulled our uniforms right up and put our legs out on the Asheville, and we were sunbaking, you know, as you do at lunchtime. And um, she goes, your ankles are getting fat. Oh, and I went, no. oh, are they? <laughs> and you know, somebody else might have laughed, but for me, I was like, and that was it, I was off. I was off and running and I was doing Thin Thighs in 30 Days. Does anybody remember that book? Um, my mum helped me put Glad Wrap around my thighs when I went to bed to see if we could sweat it out. <laughs> and I just got on this mission of perfection, just trying to be different, trying to be better than I was. 
And so it was kind of a bit of a slide in a direction from then on. And so it was this balance of being really happy to the outside world and coming across as though life is great. And then my secret thoughts at night about you know my fat thighs or whatever it was that I was focused on. And that turned into other things as I got older. So, you know, being good at business, being good at school, being good at university, all of those things. Um, and I just got so used to being like that that it felt really normal. So it felt very normal to be really busy, to push myself really hard. And it was working. The pushing myself really hard was working. So, you know, it got me good grades at school, it got me into university, it helped me to create successful businesses. But ultimately, to the outside world, everything looked great, but on the inside, I was struggling. And I think that a lot of people can feel like this. We can keep up appearances, um, and everybody else feels better if we keep up appearances. I remember when, when I had my third child, um, I was walking into the school, carrying him and taking the girls in, who were you know five and six, and somebody asked me how I was, and I said, oh, terrible. She goes, oh. And kind of walked off. <laughs> that's obviously not what she wanted to hear. She wanted me to say it was all wonderful. But at that moment, it wasn't. You know, I was very happy to have children. And I was glad that Tegan was healthy. And, but I was exhausted. <laughs> and, I, and I was honest. So I kind of learned along the way that sometimes people don't want to hear how you're really feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot has changed since then. I think that vulnerability has been celebrated. Who here knows Brene Brown? Has anybody read Brene Brown? I think that she's been wonderful in sharing her message about vulnerability. And certainly for me, um, that is not what I practiced. Um, I practiced um, what my husband would call street angel house devil. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, nice as pie to the outside world, and yeah, everything's great. And then I'd be exhausted at home and grumpy, and I'd keep working. You know, my kids would try to talk to me, but I was too busy and I was working. And that turned out okay, by the way. <laughs> too bad. Um, and so the turning point for me was really the, the worst thing that's ever happened to me, actually. Um, and it didn't happen to me, of course, that my mum passed away in. 2016 and mum was an angel so for those of you who know her um, she was an absolute angel and she was the shining example of this selflessness and this sacrifice that I guess I was modeling and mum was able to be honest with me which was wonderful before she died to say that she realized that she never took care of herself she was so busy taking care of everyone and my mum didn't just do husband kids actually dad wasn't at the top of the list to be honest <laughs> <laughs> he annoyed her a little bit um, but it was kids for sure like really took care of the kids we were like top priority and you know when we were adults she would sneak in she loved to have a key to our house and wash our clothes like oh you can see why i was upset when she died <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she, she was you know, so she set the bar really high in terms of putting everybody else first. And she used to call me and say, I'm worried about you. That's how she would start the conversation. And she was worried about me because she could see me being her. Like, she, would, it was easy. You know how you can see it in other people? Like, you can see other people doing things and, like, you just don't look in the mirror and see that you're doing it yourself. And, and so she knew that I was working too hard and I was, you know, worrying about everybody else and not myself. But she did that a lot. And so it was interesting as well because a lot of what's in the book came from my lessons from mum as well as my own life. And she said to me a few years before she died that with her breast cancer, it got to seven centimetres in diameter before she even went to see somebody. And I said to her, why did you leave it so long? Like, it's not like you didn't know it was there. You know, her boob had disappeared. All there was was a lump. And she said, well, you were pregnant with Tegan, so I didn't want to worry you. And Dad had a stroke, so I had to look after him. And that really summed everything up for Mum. Like, that really was her life, and that's, that's what she did. And I think she could see the folly in that afterwards, um, when she decided that she really wanted to live, and why did I leave it so long? And the other thing she said to me is, 
I believe that that lump is a physical manifestation of a resentment that I held towards somebody in the past that I never ever dealt with. And oh. that was the other thing about her personality is she would keep the peace and avoid confrontation. So if anybody upset her or anything went wrong, and just in case anybody in the room is worried it's them, it was actually um, my brother's first wife. So <laughs> it's none of you. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so she just felt that she just held on to that resentment, you know, and, and that just turned physical. And I say that to people when I talk to clients or people who re reach out to them and say, don't hold on to resentment. You, you might feel like you can't let go, but let go for your own sake. You know, you don't have to condone somebody else's behaviour, but you need to let go for your own sake and not hold on to that. Um, and so when Mum passed away, I was brought to my knees, which was really good for me because crying on the floor in the laundry meant that I couldn't work because I was on the floor crying. And so that was what I needed. Like, that's what I needed. And, and I see this with people who get sick. Suddenly they're you know, having chemo, so they can't keep working. It's like, you know, the whole idea of the feather, the brick or the truck. Some of us need the truck so that we just stop working. And so I was crying so much and I was in so much grief and I couldn't even pretend to the kids it was okay. They just got it, got me warts and all. And I realized that I had moved from my head into my heart. My heart got cracked open by the grief. And it was a really positive thing for me because on reflection, it was the turning point for me because it made me realize that I had avoided my emotions for all my life because I'd learned how to pretend that I wasn't having them. So I think that that was a really powerful thing for me. And when I think about self-care and what the word care means is if you think about the phrases where we use the word care, we say, I don't care about that. And it means I don't value that. And then when you say, I care for my family, it means you value them. And it also means I tend to them so I pay attention to them and they're a priority for me. And so the reason I had no self-care, apart from showering and dressing <laughs> and exercising, but that was more about achievement as well. You know, my intention for exercise used to be about staying fit and healthy. And now it's because it feels good. My whole intention has changed. I do things because of the way they make me feel. But I didn't know how I felt back then, so I couldn't make that my intention. Um, and so when we care about something, we value it and we tend to it. And what I didn't know about or care about was my emotions. And so the big shift that I've made is to be aware of how I feel, to be honest with myself about how I feel, to value how I feel, and when I notice that I'm not feeling good, to do something about it, rather than just pushing it under the rug and going, I don't have time for that. I need to keep working, I need to go and help this person. Um, and so a lot of people ask the question, when I first came up with the idea of from people pleaser to soul pleaser, it felt like inspiration, it just came to me. And I went, oh, I've gone from being a people pleaser to a soul pleaser. And, and when I started to talk about it, some people said, well, won't you become selfish? And I would say it's the opposite to that because now what I care about is filling myself up with love so that it overflows to other people rather than running on empty and trying to give to people something I don't have and saying yes to something when I don't mean it and actually doing it and kind of resenting it while I'm doing it you know so it completely changes your intention of why you do things so that's a little bit about my mum's story and my story and why I decided to have a self-care day um, who in the room, put up your hand if you think that perhaps you could give yourself some more self-care. Who feels like that? <laughs> I, think, I think everybody can. <laughs> the, the daughters are going, what about you two? <laughs> um, and so, so hopefully today you'll take some tips away from that. Um, but I'm very, very grateful to Paula. So Paula is a dear friend of mine, and the way that Paula and I met, do you know how old we were when we met? About 25. 
Um, so like halfway to here, a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> so how's Kingsley happened the other night? I met his house at dinner and we, his brother was there. We worked out that he was born in 1970 and I'm like, oh, I was 1969. And Kingsley goes, I thought you were older than that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's Kingo, I had to laugh. Um, so anyway, so I went with my business partner Mary to a function and Paula was there and she had the most magnificent pants on. <laughs> that they were either hot pink or yeah, they, were, they were hot pink. And like Santa. Oh. Santa. So she's not these leaks, right? <laughs> <laughs> pants on. And so Mary at the <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're like, we're so going to be friends with her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that was in Miss South Australia. Yeah, yeah, so Therese was Miss South Australia after me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I went to those functions. Yeah, so so that's how we met, thanks to mm -hmm. Therese. And we were, we just became friends. I found out she was a hairdresser near my house, like <laughs> literally across the road. Yeah. So then she was my bestie because, you know, we're all besties with our hairdresser. <laughs> Um, and so I got to see Paula through her single years um, and it was great fun because, you know, we were going out. I used to drink back then, so we used to party hard and, and Paula was always looking for someone tall, which makes sense. And so whenever we would go out, I would be just looking, you know, hurting my neck for all the tall guys. And I'd be like, what about him? What about him? What about him? And so anyway, she tried a few out and then... <laughs> So I thought we'd start the story, and we both got tissues shoved up our sleeves. So, and if you don't have tissues, sorry. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. So, how did you meet Sean? I don't know if I was there. Um, no. Okay. So I um, met Sean when I was about thirteen or fourteen years old um, because oh, I wasn't he was there. there. <laughs> <laughs> he was um, my cousin's best friend, and so we used to go up to Buckleboo and stay with my auntie and uncle. And, it used to be a really fun time because they had two sons, so I got to hang out with boys and their friends. And also my parents were really happy when they went and stayed in of best shape because they relaxed, you know, they were away from their business. And it was just a really happy time for our family. Auntie Beth was an amazing cook and so the food was always good. And yeah, mum and dad would have a few drinks so we'd all go down to the shearing shed with neighbours and just run around. And it was good. So I met Sean then and then um, I also ran into him at my cousin's wedding when I was about 20 and I um, thought, oh my god, this guy is a spunk. Like, he was so good looking yeah. and he was so nice. And um, But he was already married by then. He like, I got married really young the first time. So, yeah, so, and then um, I was still single in my mid-30s and my auntie said, oh, you know, Sean Simons is um, single. Would, would you like me to give him your telephone number? I'm like, sure. You know, why not? You know, I've been out with all my cousins and friends already. That's the last one left. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Um, and, yeah, so that's where we started. Um, we we met, um, we reconnected again, and he was... We were um, going out for 20 weeks before we got engaged, and then we were married quite soon after that because I was in the express lane to have a baby. <laughs> I was like, 36 man, I'm a married man, I want to have a baby. And I just want to have like, live happily for the rest of my life. And um, there was just a few tough with that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It started off good. Yeah, it started, it started off good. good. You know, you're a beautiful couple. And so I was MC at their wedding and I was 30 million weeks pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> It had to be, I had to, I wanted Tracy to be bigger than me once. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting she's pregnant. <laughs> so she waited, she got the timing of the wedding until I was about to pop. So I was a massive rolling ball and, and I had to wear flat shoes. So, so I was standing next to Paul 
taller, so she was like twice my height, so I was like this big beach ball next to her. And I wore this dress that was like a sunset. So I was like, I was like you know when you take a panoramic photo? It was like a panoramic view of the sunset around me. Um, so it was a wonderful wedding, it was so much fun. Everyone was so drunk except me. And so, yeah, so what happened after that? How did we get to where we got with the outcome? Oh, sure. sure. Yeah. Okay, okay, so so I moved to Bunkleboo. Um, we lived on Sean's parents' property. Um, we um, They moved to Tumby Bay. We had, I think, a couple of years of drought. Mm -hmm. And um, we, at that time, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, but Sean probably had quite a volatile relationship with his father. Um, Alan and Helen are still alive and they've been very kind to me, so you know that's all you know, that's all I'll say. And and I think Sean had a lot going on in his life. One, it was drought. New we were nearly married, we had a child, he had a child um, previous relationship, so he was under a lot of pressure. Financial and emotional pressure. And um, I had a newborn, so I probably didn't understand um, the pressure that he was under. And there were there were times that he had had disappeared off into the night, and I'd you know have to ring the neighbours and see where the guns were kept just to make sure that. Okay. So yeah, so it was just a, it was a high high stress situation. Yeah. And you had your baby at 36. Yeah. Yeah. So you were going through your own stuff because mm. I had a baby at 36. And I don't know if anybody else has done that, but you go through your own stuff when you're that old. Yeah. <laughs> it's like your hormones can't cope, you know. Yeah. So. And when Will was crammed too, and he was like, he had, um, you know, um, he was born anemic, so he had to get blown out. Like he wasn't feeding, and then we had to get him flown out by the flying doctors and have a couple of blood transfusions. So it was like having this new baby, not really knowing what to do. And, yeah. Yeah. and you're isolated. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you don't remember, Joe was very supportive, um, very helpful back then. So thank you, Joe. Yeah. And when when you reached out to me, so so we were friends through all of that, but we weren't close to each other anymore physically because you were off on the farm and then when Soul Pleaser started you started to follow it and you were just sort of watching it in the background and can you remember before you started to apply what you learned in Soul Pleaser where you were at because it was a lot of years afterwards but I just want to just share with everybody how long we can hold on to grief and how long it can impact our life it's you know we can see people when we see people who have lost someone and you know Erin and I talked about this with um, Joe and Lisa and some other ladies at a retreat when Erin lost her baby as well people move on they all rush around you soon afterwards but they get to move on with their lives and you still have this big piece of you missing for forever you know I, I was talking to um, Jacinta yesterday because Jacinta's lost Sava her cat who is when you don't have children is your child and she was saying to me, you seem to bounce back so much quicker after mum than what I'm feeling at the moment. I said, I wake up every day for a year and would remember that she's not here. For anyone who's lost someone, you might relate to that. Like, it's like, you wake up and you're like, that's right, she's not here. And so it was years later. How many years mm. later by the time? Well, it's three, I think back. about three years ago. Yeah. Um, so that's 17, we were 17, so 17 years. I think 16 years, maybe, on, I can't remember. So, so today it's 12 years down the track and you've reached out to me and at that point you were still really struggling. Mm. And you'd done a lot of things. You'd had therapy and, you know, you'd tried mm. a, few, a few different things. I think it was 13 or 14 years. So I suppose for me, my journey was um, a, a, a massive sense of failure because I couldn't protect Sean, I couldn't save him. I didn't see the signs. Also for my son to lose his father, but um, and and I felt like a loser. I felt like I had a black heart. 
and I felt very unworthy. But through Tracy's program, it's just really, just um, with the meditation, the, you know, the I am statements, it just really broke down my grief and um, just, I've just rebuilt my life. Like I've, I've, I was on antidepressants for a very long time and like I don't judge people on medication at all, but um, you know, I've just been, I just feel, um, I, I'm not anxious anymore, I'm not depressed, I'm practicing self-care rituals daily. I have a love in my heart that I have not had for a very long time. I have an amazing job. I work with great people. So, you know, in three years, I feel like I've just changed from a black heart to a white heart. That's probably the way that I can describe it. And, you know, I feel that I'm worthy of having a joyful life. And I probably didn't feel like that for a very long time. And, um, you know, the, the trauma of, like, I found my husband. And um, the trauma of, uh, you know, that was it took it took a little while to, to work through. And so, what do you think is the secret to how you feel now? You mentioned that you have morning rituals. What what do you do on a regular basis that is really creating the life that you're experiencing now and causing you to feel like you do now? Um, well. Um, I have to say, I'm so grateful for you. <laughs> I'm grateful for you too. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I meditate every morning when I wake up, which I thought I'd never do. Like you just can do it and you can meditate for five minutes, you can meditate for 10 minutes. Like it just doesn't matter. So I've got Doggo on the bed with me. He meditates with me. <laughs> and I like seriously, um, just don't, I just don't not do it. And mostly I'd say six mornings a week, I would go for a walk on the beach with, with my dog and just walk on the shore grab a coffee and just um, walk on um, yeah, walk on the front beach. I listen to podcasts all the time because I drive a lot with my work and I'm completely addicted to Super Soul Sunday. Is it Super Soul with yeah. Oprah? It's just so, like, the podcasts are amazing. I've redefined my, um, completely redefined my guilt around Sean dying. Like, it really, it, that was his thing. He, he chose to die and... Um, and I chose to live, you know, and I've got a beautiful son to live for, Will, and, um, yeah, so I just try and just be, fill my life with as many positive things as I can, um, and, you know, I read, you know, well, I try and read, you know, good books about being happy and affirmations. The other thing is I think I try, like, if I'm having a down day or I'm, being really negative, I will try and just go, well, Paula, you're either tired, dehydrated, and just, you, you don't have to listen. You don't have to listen to the words in your head. You can change them, like, you can say, I am, you know, I am, I'm having a good day, I'm a kind person, you know, it's just, it's, uh, I don't know, if that makes sense? Yeah, it makes great sense. Really, really well explained. And the other thing about when you don't feel good about yourself and when you've experienced something where you've gone, terrible things can happen, that's what you experience, then you feel unsafe. And when you feel unsafe, you try to control things. And in particular, in Paula's situation, you can imagine you would try to control your son because you don't want anything to happen to him. And so you can become quite controlling. And I think all of us can be like that sometimes as parents. Because we have their best interests at heart, because we adore them, and we want to really see them live a wonderful life. And so I love the story, if you can share the story around the schooling, because it's a great lesson for all of us about how this has happened. So, Well, I'll, I'll say one thing before that. I had convinced myself, <coughs> and this is me convincing myself, that Will was going to commit suicide. Like, because the, fact, the, the, ch the, the chances are that if you've um, experienced suicide, there's a higher um, much higher chance and so every time something happened to him it was like oh is his mental health okay oh my god this is going to be the next thing and I've just thrown that out the window now thank god because I was a nervous wreck but um, the other thing so Will I've, I've always wanted Will to go to, to school in Adelaide and um, I just felt for him it would be a really good thing because he doesn't have any brothers or sisters at home and um, he um, 
it would be a great experience. And um, I would ring up Tracy. <laughs> and I'd be like in tears, like uh, this is a, like a big thing. I was so frustrated with him. I was so, you know, I just so wanted it to happen. I couldn't understand why it wasn't happening. I was beating myself up about it. And then in the end, I just had to let Tracy just go, let it go, Paula, just let it go. And I'm like, you went to private school. You're from the fucking private school. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> I am so tight and made myself feel miserable. That's what I do so well. <laughs> and then in the end, I just had to let it go. And you know, he, he walked into um, home like halfway through year 11, goes, Oh, mum, now I'm ready. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> You know, pretty much all me would have said, I'm going to stop you, it's too late, you know. But we just made it happen in two or three days, more just all the nervous wreck I was in at the time. But, you know, and now he's he's away at school and he's um, he's starting his life. And um, and sometimes it's hard for him. He usually misses home and he wants to be home. And there's other really good things that are happening to him. He's um, forming a really close relationship with his um, uncle, um, Daryl, who's a beautiful person, and he's got cousins around him, he's got the boarding house mates during the week, and he's, um, you know, living a, a good life. Yeah. 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 So, Absolutely. And he's got, got beautiful friends in Portland. Well, you're such an aspiration because you really have transformed your life through changing things, changing the way you think, changing the way you feel, and by applying what you've learned. It's one thing to listen to something, and it's another thing to actually put it into action. Um, and so it's very inspiring to hear your story. So thank you so much for sharing. Well, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Just not think about it because and it, you know honestly I probably only dropped it in the last two years to be honest but somebody I actually had um, an EAP call at work which is we we've got three times that we can call a psychologist and she has said you know you're just going to be a nervous wreck if you keep on thinking this you just got to you know the chance there's a chance that he might there's a chance that he, he might not and and so I and it must have been the time because it's all about timing like it was time for me to drop it, so I just did. And, and it was like even when I did started doing the course with Tracy, I was ready to do it at that time. And there's no, there's, there's no point signing up to something if you're not ready to give it a go, because you just won't get the best outcome that you can have. So, yeah. And I would add to that that prior to that um, meeting that you had where she was telling you to drop it, what Paula had done is filled herself with some really positive concepts, general concepts about life because we can live in fear or we can live in love and so I think learning that and listening to it on repeat because it's one thing to intellectually understand something but to hear it over and over again you really start to believe it and so I really believe that life is for me so even when it feels really challenging I still believe that eventually I'll realise why this is for me, um, even if I can't see it in the moment. And so I think all of the concepts that, you know, Paula really put a lot of her time and valued the program and, and mm -hmm. really listened to it a lot. And so I think that that overrides that underlying fear that causes you to think those things over and over again. Who's a bit of an overthinker? Put up your hand in, in the room if you're a bit of an overthinker. Yeah, I think that a lot of us can be overthinkers and that will be my default if I don't do something about it, is to rehash and overthink. 
Um, and it happened to me, oh yeah. So it hasn't happened for ages because I've been doing this work for so long, it hasn't happened for ages, but not that long ago, I had an interview on an American TV show in the middle of the night, if you don't mind. So it was like four o'clock in the morning my time because it was a great time for them. So, you know, so I was awake all night trying to go to sleep, knowing that I had to get up, you know, at four o'clock to do this thing. So anyway, I got up and usually I just go with the flow, but she had given me specific questions and she diverged and went away from those questions and asked me two questions, asked me a question and then asked me the same question again. <laughs> I was like, oh. so, so it threw me. Anyway. I did, couldn't remember what I said after I got off, but I got back into bed, and the whole time I was in bed, I was like, that was terrible, that was terrible, oh my God, why did I say that? Oh, I think she hated me. Like, I just went down this track of my old self. It's like my old self came back. I was like, okay, cut this out. This is ridiculous, <laughs> stop it. So then what I had to do to myself is go, there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's done, it's in the past, move on, go to sleep. You know, so I just had to talk myself off the ledge. It's mm. like you've got two voices in your head and you've just got to listen to the one that has some reason rather than the one that you know is a little bit loopy. So anyway, <laughs> so, so the, the interview should go up on, onto their website or something somewhere. Anyway, it wasn't going up, it wasn't going up. I was like, yeah, it's terrible. They're not even going to put it up. It's so bad. They're not even going to show it. It's like, it's unshowable. Anyway, eventually it went up and I watched it and it was great. I was like... I completely made the whole thing up. Like, I, there was nothing wrong with anything that I said. And I was probably tired and sleep deprived. And that's the other point that I want to make is, if you've had a baby, you will know that when a child is overtired, they are grumpy. And it's the same with adults. So don't, when, just check in. That's why I loved when you said, oh, you're either tired or dehydrated. And this is why we want to check in and not wait till we're overtired. Just look for the signs that you're getting tired and do something about it. Because that's what I didn't do, is I just kept working. I would wake up and start working, work, 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 go to bed, think about work while I was in bed, and then wake up and start working again. Like, where's the rest? Where's the recovery? I, I'm surprised I lasted that long, actually. So it's incredible what our bodies will put up with, but if you can just tune in and give yourself a break. Anybody else got any questions? I was just thinking, uh, as you mentioned about your motor consciousness usually to make changes, and quite often those decisions just don't fit with logic. You think, no, no, I can't. But when Pauline and I did a marriage enrichment program a few years ago, one of the key things they talked about was when there's an argument, if one person just stops and remains, chooses to remain quiet, the argument has got nowhere to go. And so it's against logic because you want to keep going and getting stronger, yeah. but you just got to stop <laughs> and make that decision. And so that decision that you made worked for you so well. Yeah, that's such a good point. The husbands and wives are looking at each other. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> you should keep quiet. You should keep quiet. Yes, David. Note to self. It's such a good point because the reason it can be so hard like I can remember working with um, some of you know Annie Morris hello Annie if you watch the recording and she used to say I know that I keep saying this but I just can't stop thinking the negative thoughts and I said give yourself a break they've got some momentum you you are in the habit of thinking of them who's ever been on a diet in the room <laughs> so you you are in the habit of eating the chocolate let's say and so for two days you don't eat the chocolate, but then on day three you eat the chocolate because there is some momentum. You've been eating the chocolate for longer than you haven't been. And so you've just got to give yourself a break and realise that you're going to take some time to stick to this new habit. So don't beat yourself up. When you fall off the bike, just dust yourself off and get back on. I because think, yeah, that's what I've learned about the program is you just give yourself a break. You know, give yourself a break, like, get, 
you know, you might fall off the, the wagon for, you know, but you'll, the, the amount of time that you fall off the wagon is not the same amount of time that you are doing the good things. So yeah. sometimes, you know, you do stumble, but you just pick yourself up and, and, you, and you get that on that high vibration or that feeling better about yourself so much quicker. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the human experience. So all emotions are valid. You know, we are never going to feel pure light and love 100% of the time until we transition. So it's okay. Like all of it's good. Just embrace and allow you to feel it because you can't fake it. I mean, you can, but it doesn't work, you know. And people who really know you see right through it. Like your spouse will say what's wrong and you'll say nothing. <laughs> Obviously, there is something. <laughs> but what I've learned to do is not necessarily make up a story to justify that something's wrong. I used to feel like I had to explain myself when, when Damien said what's wrong. And so I'd make some rubbish up about what was wrong. But now I, I don't know. That's, that's what it is. I don't know. Like, anything I can do? No, thank you. But thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got it really good. We've got it worked out. And, and you know, sometimes, need a hug? I'm like, yes. No. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's just learning to communicate with each other so that you know what the other person needs. But all emotions are valid. Don't push them down because depression is pushing emotions down, um, which can cause physical illness eventually as well. So you really want to allow yourself to feel all emotions, be able to express them in ways that make you feel better, but don't project them onto other people. And so sometimes I'll call for time out. I'm like, my reaction to you at the moment has nothing to do with you, so I'm just going to excuse myself. <laughs> and when I get over it, we can talk about this again. <laughs> so, which is similar to what Errol said about. Can you do that with your teenagers as well? <laughs> yes, I think it's important to do it with your teenagers. And another thing I do with kids, and particularly when they were younger, is when, like, they just, you know, they're in the back seat and, like, deep breathing through their fighting and like, you can do this, you can do this, and then they go, like, ah! <laughs> you know, like, it's just like you explode, like you can't go for another minute. So when I used to do that, <laughs> once I recovered, I'd go one by one, I'd, get, I'd go and see them one by one, and I'd go, you know, before in the car, I am so sorry, that reaction had nothing to do with you, nothing to do with you, because we don't want our kids to be tiptoeing on eggshells around us so that they don't trigger an emotion in us because that's not up to them. We're in control of our emotions, not them. Um, and I say, I still don't love the fighting, but that emotion had nothing to do with you. So we can still have the same sentiment about the message that we want to give them, but we can definitely be human and apologise for our outbursts. And what that does with kids is it allows them to feel all emotions, but it also allows them to take responsibility for their emotions as well. Because they model us, I don't know if you know this yet, but they don't do what we say, they do what we do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about working on yourself to become a great parent. <laughs> 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 it's never too late. <laughs> That's good. So thank you everybody for being here and thank you for your questions and thank you, of course, to Paula. Um, what we're gonna do now, which is really exciting, is I'm going to um, spin a wheel on the phone and <laughs> um, pull out numbers so we can see, yeah, so we can see uh, who wins the prizes. Mm -hmm.